Now back to the show. This is AM 650's The Law Show. Sterling Fox with you, joined in studio by Joe Murphy, QC, and Angela Price-Stevens, who is a lawyer with Murphy Batista, LLP, a personal injury law firm in downtown Vancouver, down there in the Scotiabank Tower at Georgia and Granville. Uh, Angela, what is medical malpractice? Well, medical malpractice is a term that is used, it's an umbrella term. It's used to describe a situation where there, somebody feels that they've uh, had poor care. I mean, it actually means a lot more than simply poor care. Doctors are able to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. But it's where um, there are somebody's alleging that a doctor failed to meet that standard of care, the minimum standard, and uh, went on and suffered as a result of that breach. Okay. And uh, is anyone who feels aggrieved able to um, pursue a claim if they feel um, appropriately? Uh, no, no, no. It, it requires a lot more than simply feeling aggrieved. Um, there are two uh, main streams. One, there's certainly there's a, an option to complain to the college. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and then the other stream, which I deal with, would be a litigation. And there are certain criteria uh, that need to be met before a claim, before one, you may, a client may technically have a claim and, that, and you can tick the appropriate boxes to say, yes, in theory, you have a claim. Um, but then there's a quantum leap between theoretically having a claim and having what I think of as a viable claim. Right, something that will go through the courts. Uh, yeah, that would actually go through the courts right. and in the bigger biggest scheme, because you have to think of the risk. It's not just the risk for the, the lawyer. I'm, I'm thinking of risk for my client. Sure. And so you never want to put a uh, a client in a situation where you know you're you're holding their hand down the road of litigation, and yet the lawyer should know better to think well. A lot of you know, there's a lot of risk in this, right. and there's a lot of money that has to be piled into it, uh, and maybe not that much money uh, at, the, at the end of the rainbow, as it were. Right. So y- you know, you have to be very careful on those cases that are chosen. For, for litigation. And Joe Murphy, part of the risk that Angela describes from the lawyer's point of view when taking on or considering a medical malpractice action is the fact that the doctors of Canada have a, a protective association which very, very vigorously defends any and all medical malpractice claims, correct? Y- yes, Sterling. There's an entity called the Canadian Medical Protective Association that ensures essentially every doctor in Canada. Right. And it provides not only an insurance type of coverage, but it provides protection to the doctors. And it does an excellent job in protecting its doctors. The doctors have coverage that uh, doesn't require them to pay a deductible. If I make a mistake on a file and the client sues me, and it's happened, unfortunately, over my 40 years a few times, um, I have a deductible to pay on my insurance. My okay. deductible might be $10,000. If we sue a doctor who's found to be at fault or whose case uh, claim against him is settled, he or she isn't required to pay anything. So it's really a great coverage for the doctor. Where does the money come from? Um, the money comes from premiums, but most of the doctors in Canada have negotiated a deal with the provincial governments who pay them Yes. that the provincial government will also pay their CMPA premium. So the premium is being paid as part of the compensation package from the government to the doctors. Isn't but that it, interesting? But again, if I was a doctor, I'd be delighted to have the CMPA cover me. No kidding, because that, me. that's one of the beefs about uh, in America where people don't have this kind of coverage, blanket universal coverage, Angela, that we have up here. Doctors cost a flipping fortune because you have to pay their medical malpractice insurance premiums along with their fees. That's one of the reasons docs in America are so blinking expensive. That's right. I mean, the, you're looking at two very different systems. Sure. I'm not, not suggesting that you know one is necessarily better than the other, but I come from a jurisdiction where there's a happy medium and uh, for me the key word is accountability um, and I, that there, there really 
for me, for me, coming from my background, uh, I find there isn't quite so much the accountability here. And Joe has mentioned one thing already, and that's the premiums, um, deductible, no deductibility. And so uh, it's difficult and very frustrating when you find that, you know, th there's a doctor, for example, uh, who's a, a repeat offender. Mm. And you know that this doctor has really suffered no financial um, penalty personally right, because right. of his conduct time and time again over the years. Even though some compensation has already been claimed a Absolutely. few times, uh, this guy's not out a dime. That's right. Okay. But that's not, you know, the, the CMPA uh, are there for a very good reason. And I think that it's, um, you know, it, it's not that I'm suggesting that it should be easier to sue a doctor. I don't think that's necessarily a, a good thing either. Right. It's just the way in which they're defended. The net result is it it pushes up the bar as far as the value of the potential claim before it becomes viable. Mm -hmm. And that to me is, is, fairly, is quite sad because there are many clients or potential clients from whom I take calls every week that I know that if I was in my office in London, UK, I would have been able to take them on and I would have been able to get them compensation. Um, but that's not, that doesn't translate. Uh, into the Canadian From system. From system to system. Yes. As do uh, Canadian system things don't translate into the U.S. either. So Ab absolutely. It, it's a unique jurisdiction it's a and it operates on its, in its complete, in its own world. It uh, is, yes. Interesting. Joe, we talked, uh, we started to talk about this earlier and I'd like to get it from both of you. The criteria that you use at Murphy Batista with respect to taking on a case. Uh, what sort of person uh, does a personal injury law firm with the kind of track record that Murphy Batista enjoys, what sort of client are you looking for? Or is that the wrong way to even ask the question? What sort of client seeks you out? How about that? Well, I, I think really, Sterling, that second question is the key question because clients come to us in a medical malpractice claim and they almost invariably say, we can't afford to pay your legal fees unless it's a percentage of the recovery. Okay. So operating on that basis, we then look at a file. We estimate the amount of work that will go into the file, the amount of money that has to be spent on experts and assessments, and we look at what the likely recovery would be, and we ask ourselves, can we offer this client a percentage fee on these numbers? Right. Um, the Canadian Medical Protective is very aggressive in how it defends doctors. Mm -hmm. It hires excellent lawyers, and it almost gives them a blank check to defend. So there's no easy case. We So when we assess these cases, we think this case is either going to go to the courthouse steps, which means it settles just before the trial, okay. or it's going to go through a trial. So from our point of view, there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into this. And if we look at a claim that has a value... Let's say the value is fifty thousand dollars, and let's say our fee is a third. Well, that that would be a, a fee of seventeen thousand mm -hmm. dollars on a fifty thousand dollar recovery. But if we're looking at spending seventy five thousand dollars worth of work on that file, right, it just doesn't make sense. And we say to people, listen, we can't offer you a percentage fee. And I usually say to them, and that means it's not worth your while to pursue this. That that it wouldn't make sense to hire a lawyer on a fee for service if your legal fees are going to be equal to or greater than your recovery, plus the added risk that you won't win, that you'll lose. And even in cases that appear fairly obvious, because the CMPA is so aggressive, because the lawyers they use are so good, and because the experts they use sometimes will come to court and say the world's flat, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there's always the risk of losing. So when you add it all up, I say to people, you know, the doctor in this case made a mistake, a bad mistake. You were harmed by that mistake. But I can't offer you a percentage uh, fee. And that usually translates into you don't have a viable claim. Right. That it's not worth your while to proceed with this because even if you win, you come out with nothing or you even, you're out of pocket. Right. And, and where's, the, where's the value in that? Aside from, I suppose, and some people, I, I'm sure, come to the office and they're just angry, Angela. Even <laughs> even if, if, if the, the scenario works out the way Joe's dis described. Yes. yes, you were wronged, but really any damages that might be recovered maybe, maybe would cover your legal fees. Maybe. Yes. And, and they don't care. They're just so angry at having their life disrupted as... as rudely as it was by this medical event, whatever it may have been, 
they don't they almost don't care about the money that's uh that would not be um unusual at all to have a very emotional uh, if not irate client oh, sure. potential client yeah. um, but what I tend to do um, you know I tend to be pretty generous with my time um, I will usually uh, if at all possible to get them to calm down and to listen to them because I know that there are a few lawyers in my line of work who would give them that time so what I want to do is to get them to calm down enough for me to actually give an explanation of the context in which any lawyer has to work sure. and the risks involved and to repeat um, some of what Joe has said, I, I won't repeat, but, but uh, what I'm trying to get across to them is that if a lawyer says to you, I cannot offer you a contingency fee, mm -hmm. you know, it's not the lawyer necessarily protecting themselves. It, it, I say to them, if I cannot offer you a contingency fee, how can I put my hand on my heart and say, I'm not willing to risk my money, but let's risk your money. Mm -hmm. like where, where, uh, how am I giving you good legal advice? Sure, sure. It just doesn't make sense. And so usually if I've got that far, and I, you know, I usually do, um, they've calmed down and they're grateful for the time. And you know, they maybe have a grumble at the end. And, and then I'll talk to them about, well, you certainly can make a complaint. Right. Um, and I suggest you do so. And I send them the complaint form. And the idea is... To, to, to make sure that that potential client leaves me ca having calmed down and having some understanding of the uh, context uh, and not just being told, no, you don't have a claim. Right. I, I should probably, um, well, this is, this is so painfully obvious, I should have pointed it out right from the get-go, but th these conversations that you have with potential clients are free. Yes, they're free. Anyone who wants to get a, a, at least a legal opinion yes. as to how, where should I go from here? I've been in a car accident. I don't feel well. In fact, I feel like I'm probably not going to feel well for the rest of my life. I can't pinpoint what's wrong. I just don't feel well. I need to talk to a lawyer. So they can give you a call, Joe. You can uh, come down to the office and at least sit uh, opposite you and, and, and let you know what happened to them. And on that basis, at least in that initial conversation, you can let a person know whether he or she has a legal leg to stand on, right? That's that's first and foremost what most people want. Uh, that's right. They, they want to be listened to, but there are uh, numerous occasions, because I probably get five or six or seven calls a week from people with, with potential uh, medical malpractice claims, and a lot of them I'll deal with on the phone, albeit it might be 20, 30 minutes, right. by simply saying to them, listen, it would make no sense for you to hire a lawyer to advance this claim because right. if you win, you lose, and if you lose, you lose financially. Mm -hmm. um, but the ones that come into the office, we could spend up to 10 or 15 hours over time doing an assessment of their claim. And in the end, we may say, listen, we, do, we don't see that there's a claim worth your while to bring and worth our while to bring. Right. Um, I don't know of anyone else who will do that amount of work and not charge for it. If I bring a plumber into my house and he spends five hours working, he's going to have a bill for me, an electrician, an accountant. Mm -hmm. um, the, just meter, about the meter starts as soon as they cross your door still. Oh, yes, uh, taxi driver, whoever. But, you know, we do these uh, workups and uh, evaluations because we need to be able to give the client an informed opinion. Right. Yes, this is worthwhile. Yes, it's not. And there's also the importance of listening to these people because oftentimes when there's been a medical mistake made, it's because someone did not listen exactly. to them. And that just fuels the anger. If they were ignored, um, something bad happened. And then if they were ignored when they complained or brushed off, blown off, that makes people so furious, especially when their lives have been changed. Mm -hmm. We're talking so. personal injury and medical malpractice with our guests from Murphy Batista LLP, Joe Murphy QC, and Angela Price Stevens, our guests today on The Law Show here on AM650. Lots more still ahead. We're back after this. There's more of the show still ahead. This is AM650's The Law Show.